Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back here to another edition of Advanced Bass Fishing and really appreciate you guys joining us for today's episode and I'd like to thank everybody out there that's really helped uh, support the channel and get it off the ground here. Uh, it's growing really good, much appreciated and if it's your first time to the channel, I'd like to invite you all to subscribe to the channel. Guys, today we've got a, an intensive, all-inclusive, detailed, uh, in-depth discussion on chatterbaits. We're going to be talking about bladed jigs. We're going to be going over every single aspect of it. I'm going to show you guys how to set them up. We're going to talk about colors, skirt configurations, trailers you have, different type of way you can accent them, equipment to throw it on, and probably the most important part is how to fish it and the areas to fish it in. So we got a lot to cover here in today's episode. And um, this is one of the most popular lures out there. It's like, guys, if you're not fishing a chatterbait and you haven't got on the chatterbait boat over the last five years, you're missing out because a chatterbait is without a doubt one of the top ways to catch quality fish. It's It's been a dominant player in tournament competition for over 10 years now. And a lot of, really what's happened is a lot of people are just discovering the versatility of it. That's what I want to go into in detail in today's seminar is um, letting everybody know it's more than just a grass lure because a lot of people sort of have this thing in their mind that a chatterbait is just good in grass, which it is, but there's a lot of other applications you can fish and we're going to get into it. So it's going to be a good good time here. So get, get you something to drink and get relaxed. And uh, like I said, thanks for joining us for today's. And before we get started, guys, I just uh, want to invite everybody or ask everybody a favor. I'm going to put a bunch of link, uh, links in the description, stuff like my lake map breakdowns, uh, on the water lessons, bait works link, solar bat sunglasses, a bunch of different stuff. Um, it's a really good way to support the channel if you want if you want if you need to order something or want to use any of those products Just use those links in the description. That's a it's a really good way to, to give back if you enjoy what you're seeing here on the channel So much appreciated Okay, guys, let's get into it um, Right off the bat. I'm going to get into the specific bait. I want, I want to get into the chatterbait itself talk a little bit about it um, the makeup of it and go into detail about what generates the strike in it and then what I want to do is I'm gonna tie up three of three of my primary skirt colors and then we're going to match them up with trailers and accents on them and sort of the disc describe the situations each one of them works good so first of all let's get into this whole uh debate or something which has sort of been a debate if you're if you follow it between the chatterbait which is this is just the old school chatterbait so six six or seven bucks or something like that and then you got the jackhammer which is the high dollar bladed jig. Um, I think these are 15 or $16. And then you got a lot of other companies that make their own bladed jig. But by far guys, I don't think, um, there's very few people that would disagree with this. Some people say would they like a thunder cricket or whatever, but chatterbaits dominate the bladed jig market here. And these two prim primary ones. And if you guys have seen any of my intuitive angling channels, you know that I talk about that I use the original chatterbait most of the time versus the jackhammer. I just catch more fish on it. And the thing about this, it doesn't make sense. So let me describe what I mean here. And then I'm gonna talk about why I like the regular chatterbait. First of all, the jackhammer guys, the components are superior to your regular chatterbait. You got a better hook in it. You've got an incredible keeper here. This keeper is a wire that's molded into it. Um, you know, the just the overall attention to detail on the heads more realistic just a, a better made lure for sure and then the chatterbait you know you've got a, a big stainless steel hook in it and you've got a pretty rudimentary keeper and it's just a lot more basic design but even though the components on the jackhammer are superior i still catch more fish on the chatterbait and i've, I've analyzed this and i've tried to figure out what it was and the only thing that I can really determine is it has something to do with the vibration. There, it doesn't, there's no way it has anything to do with the hook and the keeper and all that type of stuff. It's got to have something to do with the, the way the blade vibrates on the particular components on the chatterbait. Because don't get me wrong, I, I don't, I'm not biased against the jackhammer, but here's how I determine that. Most of the time in my tournament practice, I would throw a chatterbait, an old school chatterbait, simply because they're cheaper and if I lost one, it wasn't any big deal. And I caught so many fish on them, I got confidence. But what would happen is, say I'd get on a good chatterbait bite, and then in the tournament, I would switch over to a jackhammer because I'd say, man, if I'm getting 
15 bytes a day on an old chatterbait, I'm gonna get 25 bytes a day on that jackhammer. And every time I did that, my bytes went downhill. I'd get, I'd get half the bytes on the, the uh, jackhammers I would the old chatterbait. So I'm gonna talk about both of them today because I'm not saying the chatterbait does not work because it definitely catches fish, but for the for purposes of the discussion, I'll give you guys my advice on it. I prefer the old chatterbait. And I buy them just like you guys do. Got guys, I don't get any discount, I don't get them free. I buy them same prices and same places that you guys do. So that's the, the standard, uh, the way I feel about that one. Now, as far as size goes, there's two sizes that I use all the time. I either use a half ounce size or the three eighths. And you can sort of see the difference in the size there. Now, a couple different situations when I choose a half ounce versus a three eighths. A lot of it has to do with the depth that I'm fishing. Let's say, for example, I'm fishing pretty shallow with it. Like I'm fishing over, you know, some shallow millfoil, shallow hydrilla, maybe around some lily pads, uh, shallow docks, grass, something like that. If I'm fishing in water that I sort of like less than three foot deep, where I'm keeping the bait a little bit higher in the water column, I usually use the 3 8 ounce. It, it's, it seems like I can reel it at a little bit more diverse speeds. I can slow it down a little bit if I have to, and it just, I get more bites on it in the shallow water. But if I'm like slow rolling the chatterbait, say for example, over, say I'm in some deeper grass beds, say I'm fishing a place like Lake Seminole or Sam Rayburn where you have some deeper hydrilla, that's when I'll go to the half ounce if I really need to keep that bait down deeper. And also with that, I know wind, wind will have a part of it too, because if you have a uh, calm day, you know, obviously the wind's not gonna be a factor, but if you're out there in a 15 or 20 mile an hour wind, sometimes even if you're fishing shallow, you need to go to the half ounce just for control of it, to for your castability and to be able to work the bait at the same speed and the same cadence through the strike zone uh, based upon those conditions with it. Same with current, current and wind would be the same thing with that. And also with that, sometimes it has to do with speed because one of the things we're gonna talk about, you know, later in the seminar, we're gonna be talking about different retrieves and speeds. But normally if I feel that the fish are reacting more to a fast retrieve, then I'm gonna to go to the half ounce because the half ounce will allow me to make more casts more accurately and I can keep that speed up without sacrificing or having the, the luger blow out on the top. So that's just a few considerations on the uh, on the size of it there. But I know some guys, they some of the companies make like a three quarter ounce and what there there's an application for that because I know that there's there's some chatterbait patterns that you can fish with a three quarter ounce and a one ounce that involves guys fishing them deep, like they're throwing it out throwing them out in 15, 20, 25 foot and slow rolling them on the bottom, those big three quarter ounce and one ounce models. But for the sake of today's seminar, we're gonna focus just on the, the more shallow water techniques with it. And we're not gonna get into anything other than the half ounce and three quarter ounce. Okay, so that's it. Next thing guys, let's talk a little bit about blades, blade colors. Blade colors, um, I'm sort of mixed with it a little bit. I, I, I've experimented around a lot with blades and I've, I've got confidence in some of the ones that I'm gonna show you here. But one of the things that I can, I can sort of pretty much tell you for sure with the chatterbait as far as the blades. The blades colors don't seem to be as important as having confidence in the colors that you have. And here's the thing about it, you cannot overlook confidence. When you're talking about something that you feel is working, like you've got confidence in a certain color setup, there is a, there's a, a mad, it's, it's a mystical, magical, reality in fishing that if you have confidence in what you're fishing it directly translates into you catching more fish <clears throat> i've had this conversation with several really high quality anglers including like rick clun and there's one of the undefinable parts of bass fishing is that connection between confidence and success in there so when i'm talking about if i tell you that i don't think like um from a scientific standpoint or, or, or data or study standpoint that blade colors make that much difference, don't discount the fact that you have to have confidence in the blade color. So if you're catching fish on a certain blade color, it's to your benefit to stay to that blade color because it will directly translate in, into more success in the water. But 
I do think there is some correlation specifically between different shades and different colors. And basically, um, I use three different colors of blades here. The first color that I use, is, and which is my favorite, is a solid black. Now, a lot of the, the chatter baits out there, they, they've sort of, they, they've changed the way that they uh, put the black on the blade because a lot of them has, they, they have this like it's a chrome, this is like a black chrome and I don't like it. I like the regular black. So what you can do guys, and this is what I do all the time, is um, get you some black fingernail polish. And I touch them up throughout the course of the day. I may have to reapply this, you know, four or five times during the day. But on any black blade or any, you know, polished black, is I always come through and I touch them up with black fingernail polish on there to get them sort of a, a and I do like the glossy black as far as when you're buying fingernail polish, you know, get the glossy black over the flat black. I just, again, confidence, but I, I really got a lot of confidence in it. But go over your blades with black fingernail polish and it's uh, definitely, uh, it will definitely help out because what happens when you're fishing that chatterbait, you will chip the paint on it because when that, when that blade is knocking against the bottom and rocks and when you're casting it, it knocks maybe against the hook or whatever, you're going to, and the, the swivel actually will chip some paint on it. You're going to have to touch it up throughout the course of the day, but the black is my favorite. And we'll talk about how I pair it up here in a second with different ones. Now, the second one guys is a, just a silver blade. Now the silver blade is the, is the one that I'm throwing most of the time. If I feel the fish are completely focused on shad, so they're feeding on shad almost exclusively most of the time. And I'll show you some skirt stuff. I'm using it on some type of a shad colored skirt. And, um, uh, but if I am confident that that's what they're feeding on, that's what I'm going to use as far as the silver. And the last one is a gold. And guys, it is hard to beat gold if you're fishing around grass. If you're fishing around grass, I don't know what it is about it, but this is the choice that I use most of the time when I'm fishing around grass. I just, the fish just really like it for some reason. So <clears throat> between the three, I'll be using the gold and grass in a lot of situations, particularly if it's sunny out. If it's sunny and you're fishing grass, uh, brighter conditions, it's the gold. If I'm fishing around hard objects like around docks or something like that, I'm gonna use the silver. If I feel the fish are on a shad spawn or around shad, the silver. And then the crawdad or the black is I'm gonna use it anytime that I feel the fish are feeding more on crawdad and perch. And um, I also will fish the black over grass, especially on cloudy days or days that are really windy on there. So um, the blade color, like I said, you're gonna have confidence in certain ones out there. And a lot of the times you just have to mix and match them up because when you're talking about the blade colors and skirt colors, you can have a foundation on what you think is gonna work good, but ultimately you just have to try it a little bit to see if it's gonna work. And one of the good things that I will do on blade color, let's say for example, if I'm fishing and I, I catch two or three fish in an hour on a black blade, and I know there's some fish in the area, I may change to the silver or the gold just to see if I can get more bites in it. And if I fish that for an hour and don't get any bites, then I'll go back to the blade. So that's just part of the experimentation you use with skirts and with blades, but with blades both on there. Now I know there's some other guys that use different colored blades, like some browns and green pumpkins and that type of stuff, reds. I've tried, green pumpkin and, and brown on my blades before. And guys, I hadn't done that very good because I really thought that I could pair up a green pumpkin skirt with a green pumpkin blade and catch more fish on it. But for some reason, the black uh, with the green pumpkin gets me more bites than the uh, green pumpkin on green pumpkin for some reason. I will tell you one thing that works pretty good. And this is, uh, I was telling, I'll tell you this tournament that I caught them on. I've caught them in several different tournaments on this color setup. Now, I don't have one with me here but a chartreuse blade will work pretty good at times. I was fishing a uh, FLW tournament down at Lake Okeechobee. And you know Lake Okeechobee, it's pretty much a mud pit other than, you know, just some few clean water back areas, backwater areas. And I was in this one area there that um, the water, it was it a was too, little too dirty. It's like um, for, for, for a regular reservoir, maybe not much, but in this area, the water visibility was only like that, maybe six or eight inches visibility, which is pretty muddy for Okeechobee. 
And I haven't, I didn't do that. I've never done good in water clarity at Okeechobee like that. But anyway, the water, the water clarity where I, where this area was, it was over one of the best looking grass beds you've ever seen. It was beautiful grass. I mean, it was a big grass flat everywhere. And I just said, why, why would those fish leave this grass bed if, um, if there's so much cover here, even if it is a little dirty. So anyway, you know, I was fishing a chatterbait. I was throwing like a black one, didn't do any good. And I had a chartreuse bladed chatterbait and I put a chartreuse skirt on it and I took a chartreuse, or I took a trailer and I colored the trailer chartreuse. And guys, in about an hour's time, I caught easy over a 20 pound bag on this chartreuse chatterbait. So that's another thing to consider. Chartreuse can work good in, in dirty water conditions with that. Okay, now let's get into skirts. Um, there's three primary skirt colors that I'm gonna tie up here. I'm gonna show you the ones, I'm gonna tie them up, um, and I'm gonna explain to you the conditions with it. Then we'll get into the trailers with it. But one of the things like we talked about, if you guys saw the jig seminar I did, guys, do yourself a favor and get you a jig tying skip kit. I mean, there's you can get them about anywhere. I mean, Baitworks has got them, Bass Pro, Tackle Warehouse, whatever. And by anywhere that sells tackle has jig tying skirt materials, you know, which are just single skirt layers like this. But when you're dealing with jigs, spinner baits, chatter baits, buzz baits, swim jigs, you can create your own colors that nobody else has. And do not underestimate the importance of that because so many of the colors, like for example, this, this jackhammer here, white and chartreuse, this is a stock color that you could get at Academy or whatever. This is what everybody fishes. And if everybody is buying a white and chartreuse chatterbait at, at Academy, that's what the fish see most of the time. But with a skirt tying kit, you can tie up your own skirts and it really makes a big difference. So anyway, let me, I'm gonna tie the, the three that I, that I like here. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tie up each color of skirt and then we're going to put the trailer on that I like on it and we're going to talk a little bit about that okay the first the first one let's just go with the green pumpkin because if out of all the colors guys green pumpkin is my favorite color and I'm going to show you what I do now first of all we talked about this before the skirt they're, they're easy to tie like I said this is a skirt tying pliers this is a little ring you know you put it over the end of it actually I broke my pliers here I don't have a way to, to hold them to fix them but the rubber goes over it like that where you open it up. So I'm gonna take my skirt layers. I've got two skirt layers here, and this is the color that I like on the chatterbait. See, this is the barbed wire green pumpkin. Now most places, guys, they have a wide variety of green pumpkins. They may have 30 different variations of green pumpkins, but I really like this barbed wire. Anytime you got the barbed wire look to it, it just seems like I catch more fish than like something that, like this is just like a straight green pumpkin. See the difference on it? So I do like the barbed wire. So the next thing I'll do is I'll come in and put my uh, skirt through there. And again, I'm gonna show you how to cut it. When you bring it through there, only like we talked about before, you only bring it through about this much. And it, so your collar is about only about a quarter of the way up on it. And you do this because it's gonna hang better I'll show you, get my plier. So we'll cut the ends of it off, flare them out. So that's the finished skirt, the way it looks there. And the next thing we'll do, we're gonna slap it, or uh, put it over the chatterbait. But what you wanna do is you wanna put it up like this, where the long side is on the top, and then open it up where you've got a clean opening to it. And put your skirt in there, thread it up on there. And then once you get it on, you got to distribute the uh, skirt material evenly around the rest of the chatterbait. And also make sure guys, when you're tying these, some of the, some of the skirt layers sometimes are going to get stuck together. So you sort of have to open them up, but try to just get it even, even around like that. So see, it's a little bit longer. As you can see, it hangs down. 
Okay, the next thing we're gonna do, guys, is we gotta figure out the best trailer that we want on it. Now, there's a, the, as far as the trailers on the green pumpkins, I'm matching it with the green pumpkin trailer all the time on there, just different variations with it. Now, the first trailer that I like is my favorite one is the Zoom Z-Craw here. This is a flat-sided, it's got a curly tail on it, and uh, I do use the full Z-Craw most of the time. So, move it on like that. And that's the way it looks right there. And the thing about this guy is it wobbles, not only that the whole bait will wobble, but you've got the tails flapping on the bottom that really attracts a lot of attention from the fish. I just, I really like this trailer. I get a lot of bites on it. And another thing that I'll do guys is depending upon what I'm trying to resemble here, I'll sometimes dye it. If I'm, if I'm trying to resemble a perch, I will take and I'll put chartreuse dye on the tails a little bit. Even if the water is pretty clean, let me mark it up here a little bit. I'm a big believer in dye, guys. I, I use a lot of dyes. If you guys have watched much of my stuff, you see it. I think it makes a big difference. But a little bit of chartreuse on the dye there. And this right here is going to really be a, a, a good perch imitator. Now, sometimes also I'll put like some accent, maybe some orange in there a little bit, maybe a little bit of chartreuse to make it look even more perchy. But this uh, perch pattern right here, it's gonna work good in a couple different situations. First of all, a perch pattern is one of the top colors that you can use when you're fishing around grass. Now, all you guys that fish, if you're fishing Florida, if you're fishing TVA lakes, Lake Seminole, lakes in Texas, if you guys fishing up north that have lakes up there, this is by far my favorite color for grass. You know, without a doubt, I get a ton of bites on the perch pattern in grass. And I'll get into how to fish a little bit later, but that's uh, my favorite setup for that. Now, the other one that I use, which a lot of people don't do, guys, is I'll take a lizard, like a six-inch zoom lizard, and I'll pinch the head of it off and thread the lizard on. Now, I'm not trying to resemble a lizard. I'm just trying to get more, more action, you know, to generate strikes. And this lizard, guys, I've caught a ton of fish on it, particularly in the pre-spawn. So it gives the lure a lot larger profile. You've got the tails wiggling on the side. Again, I'll dip it chartreuse in there. But a lot of times if I'm fishing this, like when the water temperature's in the low to mid 50s in the pre-spawn, you know, catch a lot of fish on the, the, uh, the lizard on there. Those are my two primary trailers. But with the trailers, you can, um, it's really up to your imagination. I mean, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what my favorite ones are here, but you know, as far as the trailer, I've heard guys catching them on everything, literally. I mean, I've heard them catching them on tubes, I've heard them catching them on, you know, craws, on whatever. So they'll pretty much hit any type of a trailer on there because the jig is gonna give the, the trailer action, but there are some, like I said, I've just got more uh, confidence in, than others. Okay, so that's the green pumpkin one. Now the next one go, what we're going to do guys, we're going to tie up a, a shad pattern here. Now the shad pattern, I'm going to guess for the most part, it's probably the most, uh, pro pr probably the most heavily fished. I think that most people, when you're talking about chatter baits, they fish a white chatter bait or a pearl chatter bait, you know, most of the time, it just seems like that's sort of the fallback color on it. Sort of like for most people, black and blue jigs work good and white and chartreuse spinner baits. It's sort of the same with the chatter baits. So I'm gonna show you my shad pattern here, what I like. Now for my shad pattern, the thing, here's again, this is sort of my little secrets I'm sharing with you on advanced angler here. What I found at work is I do two layer skirt on my shad patterns. And one of them is sort of like a translucent barbed wire. And the other one is sort of like a cotton candy or it's got a little bit of blue in it like that. Um, but this is the two that I mix together for my shad pattern. Personally, guys, I do not like um, white. A lot of people like just a solid white, but to me, a solid white stands out way too much. And when you use the more translucent colors, it, it just looks more natural because you can increase the visibility that you want on your chatterbait by changing your trailer up. So I'll show you how I rig this one up here. And sometimes I will use two and a half strands, but for the most part, I like to use two strands in the jig skirts or in the chatterbait skirts. One 
once you get used to using the skirt tie material thing, it's pretty easy. But it does, there's a little bit of a learning curve with it. I got that. Cut that one off. I actually get my skirt tie material. There's a place here in Springfield, Missouri called uh, Fin and Feather, and they've got a huge selection of it there. But that's where I get most of mine at. But okay, same thing. We're going to come into the top, long side on the top, up high. And uh, another thing with this, guys, is the I just this is just the head color I got. Don't pay attention to that. If I'm fishing a uh, chatterbait with the uh, shad pattern on there, I scrape the, the lead off of there with a knife where, it's, where the lead is actually bright, but this is just on there for sakes of the demonstration. So that's one, what's one uh, a piece of advice I'd give you is uh, scrape it down to lead because pure lead is a really good color on there. I don't like a white head at all. And it's the same deal. So I'm gonna space it out, you know, get everything going there. Now, okay, the shad pattern, guys, when you're talking about this, your trailer has got to reflect the shad pattern that you have. So you're gonna have different colors. Now, there's two, I have two favorite trailers that I like to use when I'm using a shad pattern. One is a rib swim bait, like this Zoom Z swim here. Now this is probably one of the most popular swim bait or uh, chatter bait trailers out there, and it does work really good. This is a really good, uh, you know, trailer to use. It's got a lot of action. It, it's got a lot of bulk on it as far as it's round, so it, it increases the bulk of the bait. But just the uh, rib swim bait, three and a half inch trailer. This is standard. A lot of people fish this for good reason. This is a good way to fish it, guys. You get a lot of bites on this right here with, with this color. And then the other one I like, and I sort of mixed it up half and half, is this, is this Mega Bass 4-inch Spark Shad here sort of the same deal with it. And um, I'll show you another shad option here in a second after we get done with this one. <clears throat> but the Mega Bass Spark Shad on there, it's the same type of a deal. It's just, it's just you got your boot tail swim bait here. And guys, this is a really good color. And like I said, anytime the fish are feeding around shad. I mean, I'll mix it up, like I said, with either the gold blade or the silver blade, but um, this is the color that I use under the conditions where a couple of different conditions here. Let's talk about this a little bit. It's the time that I'm using the shad pattern. A lot of it has to do with the water temperature and the water clarity. If the water temperature is pretty cold or if the water temperature is really hot, that is when I get more bites on the shad pattern. So I either use this at the beginning of the pre-spawn, like when the water temperatures are in the low 50s, or I use it in the middle of the summer when the water temperature is in the 80s or late in the fall, again, when the water temperatures are starting to get cold. For some reason, a shad pattern works good in those two extremities, hot or cold. <clears throat> again, I don't really know why. I can't really intellectualize and tell you why it is. It's just, it's my, it's reproductible re results that I get. And a lot of the stuff that I share on all my YouTube channels Guys, this is stuff that works for me through reproductible results. I've, I pay close attention to things that produce and how well they produce over long periods of time. And that's what I found out about the shad pattern skirts. You know, warm or cold is gonna be really good with that. Water clarities too have a little bit to play with it. Now the water clarities that you use a shad pattern in, it can be, it can vary greatly because a shad pattern, like for example, if you use a white, like just like a bright white color, which I don't like to use very much, it probably stands out better in dirty water than almost even a chartreuse. A, a bright white is a really good color to use in dirty water. And then on the flip side of it, there's a lot of different skirt color variations that are very translucent. And some of those really, really translucent colors are good in extremely clear water. like. I've done good out at Lake Mead in Nevada on a chatterbait with a with like a clear translucent skirt, which is a shad pattern, same type of trailer. So um, those are the conditions where, you know, that works pretty good with that. Another thing about shad patterns is I found that the fish bite them a little bit better if the bait is up in the water column. So I don't get many bites on a shad pattern if I'm fishing it slow rolling it through the grass or, uh, you know, 
fishing it on the bottom like that, it's normally above the grass or a little bit higher when the fish can come up on it. Maybe because shad don't swim on the bottom too much or swim through grass or always above it. That's that's one uh, theory there. And a lot, again, a lot of this with fishing, it just is theory. So, okay, now one other uh, thing here, and we'll take a little break after I show you this, guys, is um, I'm going to show you the skirtless chatterbait setup, but how I use with that. Now the skirtless chatter, chatterbait setup is something that we use with a bigger swim bait. And there's two swim baits I use with this. One is the Mega Bass uh, Magdraft six inch freestyle with no hook in it. And the other is the five inch Mega Bass Spark Shad. I prefer the Spark Shad simply because it's, it doesn't quite have as much mass on here. I've really got to be on a big fish bite to use the six inch Magdraft because it's a big piece of plastic. But what I'll do is I'll take the uh, five inch mag draft. And again, guys, all this stuff is available at Baitworks I'm talking about. I'll put the link in the description for them. And um, I just thread it straight on with no skirt on here. And I'll tell you how I got on this deal because I didn't figure it out. I, somebody else did and I, I figured I started using it. This is the setup for that. Now guys, this right here is my post spawn deep grass setup. This is, that's the only time that I really use it. I was fishing, um, it was a FLW tournament down at Kentucky Lake and I was fishing this big flat with one of the other anglers out there and I was doing good in the tournament. I had 22 pounds, I think the first day and this other angler fishing around me, he, he wasn't doing too good, but he told me he wrecked them in practice and this is what he was throwing, the big giant swim bait with no skirt on there and those fish, they were post-spawn fish in that grass bed, feeding up on gizzard shad on that grass bed. And I, so I started doing this. When I got into that situation where I was fishing deeper grass in the post-spawn, uh, close to the bottom, this big swim bait here, no skirt on it, will get you a big bite. And it's, uh, your bites are gonna go down for sure. I'll show you what it looks like on the, uh, the freestyle magdraft here. But it's, um, if you got a situation where you think there's a lot of four and five pounders in there, this will get them to hit it. Here's what it looks like on the free, on the uh, freestyle. You can see how big this bait is right here, but you still have quite a bit of hook out on the regular chatter bait. So that's the setup like that. Okay, guys, I'm gonna take a quick break and get some to drink. I've been talking for 30 minutes. So I'll be right back. Okay, guys, here we are back. Uh, one thing I wanted to remind you guys real quick before we got started here, you might notice when the video starts and throughout the video, you'll see a little thing that says view products in there, guys. That's uh, 30 products I put in, in, in every video. And if you if you uh, order, if you click on one of those products and order one, uh, the uh, channel gets a small percentage of the profit of the sale of that. So if you're looking to buy some tackle that I've had listed on that or any of my other videos, that's another good way to support the channel. So thanks a lot on that. Okay, guys, finally, let's get into the last color here. Then we're gonna get into equipment. I'm gonna show you about the black and blue. Now, I already got it tied up to sort of save time a little bit. Um, here's the other one, the last color that I use is the black and blue. Um, usually, again, I've got one strand of black, one strand of blue in there. So it's pretty bright like that. And I pair it up with the uh, Zoom Z-Craw with the black sapphire on there. It's got, which is black and blue creature bait here. I'll rig that up on there. Now, out of all the colors, guys, out of the green pumpkins and the shads, um, all that type of stuff, I'm gonna say that the black and blue is probably the color I use the least, but I do use it, you know, quite a bit. I just don't use it as much. That's the black and blue setup there. Now, the time that I use the black and blue setup, a couple different situations. <clears throat> Anytime that I'm fishing around, <clears throat> excuse me, water visibility that I call um, sort of tannic water with it, a lot of the water like in, in the south that has uh, where you've got a lot of shallow vegetation, it's got that black clear tannic water and a black color, guys, is really good around that type of cover. And also black is a really good color around lily pads. If you're fishing around lily pads, it, it, must, be, it must have something to do with the shade that the lily pads put in. But anytime I'm fishing around lily pads, I do like a black in there. So those are the two situations for that. And also, if you guys fish at night, a, a black chatterbait's one of the best night fishing lures out there. I, I got a buddy that he's a huge night fisherman. We we used to fish spinner baits all the time for fish at night, and he's been using that black chatterbait at night forever and catching a ton of fish on it. So, okay, so that's pretty much the colors. We've been over that, guys. Now let's get into the equipment because the equipment is critical, guys, in chatterbait fishing because 
you wouldn't think it with the, with the big hook on a chatterbait like this that you'd lose many fish, but chatterbait, you will lose a ton of fish on them unless you have the right setup and you set the hook right. It's so critical. And how I learned about it is I used to lose a ton of fish on a chatterbait. I was, I, I'd lose probably set, or 25% of my bites on it. And I got studying Brett Height. And Brett Height was one of the, he's probably the most famous chatterbait fisherman in the country. And I started watching every video that I could of Brett Height throwing a chatterbait. And I studied him in detail about what he did on it. And I picked up a bunch of tips just from watching videos on it. And I used it in my own fishing. And ever since I changed up, I land so many more fish. I land most every bite that hits me on there with this setup. So first of all, let's talk about the rod. The rod is critical. Um, I use a seven foot, 11 inch. This is the Mega Bass Oroshi launcher, seven foot, 11 inches long. And the most important thing about this rod guys is the tip on it. It's got a medium action tip, which means the tip on it is, is fairly soft on it. It's got a fairly bendable tip on there. And that's what you want when you're fishing a chatterbait guys, you have got to have a medium tip rod. If you try to use a chatterbait on a rod that's too stiff, you will lose those fish. It makes a huge difference on there. So get yourself, get you a long rod, something that over seven foot long, uh, it's got a medium tip and that's gonna make a big difference. And the length is critical, guys. You want a long rod like the 7-Eleven launcher because it allows you to do a lot with the bait as far as manipulating it. I'm gonna show you here just in a second with that. Now the line that we're talking about, there's basically, um, four different pound test line that I use. I use Seaguar and Vizex line for everything. And I use 15 pound test, 17, 20, and 25. Um, most of the time I'm using 17. The, the time that I use 15 is if I'm fishing clear water situations like Lake Mead, clear water environments with a translucent skirt, um, where I'm trying to get that bait down a little bit deeper. 17 pound test line is my go-to for most all the time. If I'm fishing, just your average grass bed, or if I'm fishing around shallow targets or docks or whatever like that, 17 is probably my favorite. I use 20 if I'm fishing around shallower grass or thicker cover, or if I'm fishing a half ounce model um, a little bit faster. And I use 25 if I'm fishing super shallow, super thick cover, like thick grass, thick lily pads, stuff like that. But most of the time it's 17 pound test. So here's the important part, guys. I wanna show you how get the camera down here. I wanna show you guys how to correctly manipulate the chatterbait as far as to get bites on it, to get a lot of bites on it. And um, this is one of the most critical things about it. So anyway, here, here's the thing, the reason that you want the long rod. Number one, the long rod can allow, you can make a longer cast with it. And if you're fishing open water, this is critical, making a long cast with it. And also if you're fishing targets and you're fishing uh you know docks or whatever you can pitch the chatterbait in and around the corners of docks um, and when you set the hook on a chatterbait you take up so much more line with the longer rod and also i just i think you can just manipulate it a little bit better so what i do is with this guys i'll make the cast out there and there's several different retrieves that i use based upon the cover that i'm fishing now let's talk about grass if you're fishing let's talk about deeper grass say grass beds that are, you know, in five to 10 feet of water. What I'll do with that is I'll make the cast out there. I'll let it hit the bottom with that. And the first thing I do is, is I pump it off the bottom to get the blade going. And once I pump it off the bottom like that, I put my rod tip down low and I just start just a medium retrieve. And then all of a sudden I'll speed the handle up like, like a half a turn, I'll five or six cranks and then speed the handle up a half a turn like that. And that speeding that handle up like that, a lot of times will trigger them. And another thing, guys, is you don't ever want to point the rod straight at the chatterbait. Make sure you got your rod, you know, like at a 60 to 45 degree angle, because that way, when that fish hits it, the soft tip of the rod over there will load up a little bit and allow that chatterbait to get deeper into the fish's mouth. That's the first way. Now, the second way is I'll throw it out there, and this is probably my my favorite way to fish it is I'll throw it out there, let it sink down to the bottom of the grass bed and I'll pump it up and let it go to the bottom like that, reel down and I'll pump it up off the bottom. 
And that's what I do all the way back to the boat. It's like, I, it's like I'm pumping it, letting it fall back down, reeling it at the same time, pumping it, maybe where it'll go four or five feet off the bottom and down. And guys, in grass, this is a great way to fish the bait because normally there's two ways they'll hit it. Number one is when you pump it up like that, they're there and you just set the hook on it. And the other way is when you pump it up and let it fall back down, you'll just see your line jump. And some of the most exciting strikes I've ever got on chatterbaits is when that was when you let it drop back down and your line will literally just like go boom, just like that. Super fun way to fish it. Now, here is the really important thing to remember on chatterbait fishing is the hook set. Now, this is the thing that I studied Brett Height forever about it because what happens in a chatterbait is a lot of times you go long distances of time without a bite and you're sort of like a live nerve in and you'll be reeling it through there and all of a sudden one will bite it and you'll just go boom just like as fast as you can it's like as soon as that fish hits it you ju you're just like a live nerve in and you just set the hook on it here's what you got to do and you know, what you have to remember when you're fishing a chatterbait you have to expect the ca you have to expect a strike every single cast and expect it at every second like you're reeling the bait like this and it's like, he's gonna hit it, he's gonna hit it, he's gonna hit it. And when you get that strike, guys, all you do on it is start reeling and pull the rod like that. And then start reeling fast. This is the key, I can't stress enough. There's no setting the hook like that. It's reeling, okay, all of a sudden your rod gets heavy, he's on there. Just start reeling and pulling the rod back like that. Reel it and pull it at the same time and keep reeling like that. Keep reeling at that fast speed like that and get that fish coming to you the same way. And don't stop until that fish gets to the boat and it decides at that point where it wants to go. It's like, if you're reeling that fish to the boat and you see it's a five or six pounder and all of a sudden it starts going that way past the boat, don't try to reverse it like that. We talked about that on the jig. Just follow the fish around and always keep the fish moving in the same direction. Don't ever try to reverse the direction of that fish. And you know, the only time that you ever want to make an adjustment is if that fish starts making a big run. And then we talked about before, just push your thumb bar, let the fish take it until he turns and then get him reeling back to the boat. But that is super critical information. That information that I just gave you right there, guys, on the hook set and how to work it, it may not have seemed very much, but you do not underestimate the value of that information that you got right there. That came, that that's something that took me years of heartache and lost money and sorrow to figure out. So uh, uh, just absorb that there. So anyway, guys, that's pretty much the technical detail. Now let's get into the patterns, what to look for, where do you want to fish it? So I'm gonna take a quick break, we'll get into that. Okay guys, we're back. Now let's get into the uh, patterns, as far as seasonal patterns with the chatterbait what you need to look for in different type of areas, uh, boat positioning, that type of stuff a little bit. What I want to do on this is I want to sort of go through the prime chatterbait seasons from a seasonal aspect, which are spring, uh, summer, excuse me, spring, summer, and fall. Um, we're not really going to talk much about winter chatterbait fishing because it's winter is relative to where you're at. And if in a true winter situation, there's not much of a chatterbait bite But I want to talk about through the uh, pre-spawn up until the uh, late fall, what you need to look for. So let's talk a little bit about the pre-spawn first. Now the pre-spawn, it has to do whether your lake has grass in it or not. Now when you're determining the type of areas that you need to fish, you know, some of you guys have grass lakes, some of you guys don't. So this is totally determined depending upon if your lake has grass or not. So I'm going to sort of give you something a little bit both on there. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the lakes that don't have grass on it. We'll, we'll go through the patterns with the non-grass lakes, and I'll go back through it with the grass lakes. Now for the non-grass lakes, um, here's what you have to look for. Pre-spawn is, is probably my favorite time to fish it when you're talking about chatterbait fishing. So when that water temperature starts to get into the low to mid 50s, this is prime time for a chatterbait. And when I'm doing this, there's two different deals that I'm fit, how, how I'm fishing on this. I'm always fishing the, um, the crawdad pattern most part. So I'm fishing some type of a green pumpkin, <coughs> green pumpkin with maybe a little bit of orange in it, something like that. 
Um, a lot of times I'll use a lot of orange. Sometimes I'll, I'll dip half the trailer in orange. I find that that works really good. And another thing I'll do with that is sometimes I'll put a lot of orange accent in my skirt color during the pre-spawn. Just something about that time of year, it really works good. And I'm looking for any type of rock and wood cover that's available in the lake. Now, every lake has a different amount of it. Probably my favorite thing is to get into those pre-spawn areas that have channel banks. So I'll go back and say, for example, to a major creek arm and I get on the steeper channel banks and I just start working those channel banks back into the creek. I'm cast into the bank, I'm slow rolling the bait. I'm trying to keep it close to the bottom and I'm targeting sort of that two to five foot zone. That's a really good uh, way to catch them. And this is how you catch your, this is how I catch my biggest fish on a non-grass lake every year is fishing those channel banks by slow rolling it. And um, channel banks, it doesn't, you know, they can be bluffy, they can be chunk rock, it doesn't really matter. That's just where a lot of those pre-spawn fish go. Now, obviously, if you have a lay down tree or a stump, that's a bonus, that's probably gonna be good with that. But also fishing it around dock corners is really good in the pre-spawn. So if you're back in some of those creeks and you have either piling docks or floating docks, always make sure you hit the corners of those with it. You're gonna find out during the pre-spawn that a lot of those fish, are, they're more on the outside part of it, so target those areas on it. Now, the spawn type, the spawn, when the fish are actually spawning, chatterbait's not that great, but most fish don't spawn at the same time, so there's always seems like there's a bite going even when a lot of the fish are spawning. But as those fish get past the pre-spawn and the spawn, and they start to get in the post-spawn, on a non-grass lake, this is when those fish sort of make a transition more to man-made cover. And um, a lot of it has to do with the shad spawn because like here in Missouri, our post spawn is like in May and that's when we have a lot of shad start spawning. And that's when I start going to the shad pattern uh, chatterbait in, May in the May time of the year, fishing it around hard structure where I think the shad are spawning. So this would be riprap, like dam riprap, uh, bridge riprap, riprap between docks. Um, and docks themselves, any type of hard structure where those shad like to get up against and spawn. And that's when I go back to that shad pattern chatter bait with like the swim bait trailer on it, works pretty good with that. But I don't use the, uh, the crawdad pattern too much in the, in the post spawn like that. Now, in the uh, summertime, once it starts getting in the summer period, um, that's when I'm going more to the perch pattern. And it's like sort of the same deal. There's a, the summer, you have your early summer, midsummer, and late summer. Early summer, you still have some elements of the post spawn, but one of the things you'll find in the summertime, and we've talked about this a lot, is a lot of perch live shallow all summer. They spawn shallow, like in the back of the coves and you know, just in shallow water. So I'll take that perch pattern chatterbait, you know, the green pumpkin with the chartreuse, and I go back into those areas that have the mix of wood, rod and, wood, <laughs> wood and rock where I think those perch are spawning and I fish that chatterbait shallow, less than five feet, of deep, feet, feet deep in the summertime. And I'm really keying in on shade. It's like shade is so important at that time of the year. So I try to target those banks that are catching a lot of shade longer in the morning and fish that chatterbait super shallow on that. Now. As the fall gets in here, like you're, like say for example, September now, that's when I sort of go back and I mix it up between the perch pattern and the shad pattern. It's, it's like both of them work decent that time of year. And this is when you can do really good on shallow wood. It's in, the, in September, October, and November, I look for shallow laydowns, I look for shallow wood. Sometimes you'll have flooded cover in the fall, but not very often. But one of my favorite patterns is to, is to run to the upper creek or upper river extremities and fish that chatterbait on any shallow wood. Lay down trees, blow down trees, logs in the water. Um, doesn't really get a lot of pressure on that. These are these are areas most people would fish like a square bill crankbait or a jig or you know spinnerbait or something like that. But definitely that shallow wood will will shine in the fall time of the year. Now back on to backtrack a little bit to reverse that um, on gra on lakes that have grass on there is if you're fishing a grass lake, one of the things that I found out, like we talked before, is that gold blade with the shad pattern skirt is really gonna work good in the pre-spawn. And just getting out over those grass beds and using that pumping motion a lot of times, that pumping motion is really, really good. And especially if you have brighter days. Now, if the days are a little bit uh, dirtier or a little bit cloudier with a lot of wind, 
That's when I sometimes I will go to that black blade and the green pumpkin over the grass like that. The key in the pre-spawn, guys, is you have to determine whether the fish want that pumping retrieve or the straight reel, the, you know, the stop and go reel. The retrieve can be everything on it because sometimes they will not touch a straight retrieve and the, then other times, you know, that's what they want. They won't, they won't touch a pump and retrieve. So a lot of it is the, is the personality of the fish. They, they change day by day, but getting out there on those big grass flats in on the main lake and the major Creek, depending upon how the lake's set up, um, where you think those fish are staging at. Like for example, at Lake Seminole in Georgia, a lot of those fish will stage out on the main lake and the pre-spawn, you can catch them out there. Uh, Sam Rayburn, sometimes they're out there at the mouths of those big creeks. So wherever the fish are in the pre-spawn stage, that's where you need to be on that. Um, grass lakes, they have, it, it, it's a little bit different on grass lakes as far as the seasonal progression with it, because on a grass lake, I don't, I've never done any good on a grass lake, a true grass lake that has offshore hydrilla and uh, milfoil. I stay offshore all year long. If I, it pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn, post summer and fall, I never go to the bank because I think there's always a group of fish out there depending upon the depth of that flat. But most grass flats, depending upon whether it's hydrilla or milfoil, they're gonna have grass anywhere between three to 10 foot deep in that zone. And so I, I just always stay out on those grass flats and I just meander and cover as much water as I can trying to target the depth that the fish are in or trying to figure out where the grass is a little bit thicker or a little bit sparser. Now, one thing you're going to find out about chatterbait fishing on a grass flat, and again, I don't live scope, so live scopers may have a, a different you know perspective on this. It's just a matter of hard work. So I'll get out there on, let's say I'm fishing Sam Rayburn. And if you guys fish Sam Rayburn, you know a place called the Beach Basin. The Beach Basin is one of the most famous places on Sam Rayburn and it's got a lot of grass and a lot of flats in there. So say for example, if, if I'm fish, I don't care if it's March, April, May, June, July, September, or whatever, I'll get out there on those big grass flats and I'll make one pass maybe in 10 foot of water. And if I catch them fine, if I don't, the next thing I'll do is I'll make a pass like in seven or eight foot of water. And I systematically make passes in different water depths until I, you know, figure out the depth that the fish are in. And also you have to pay really close attention to the changes in the grass because that's what groups fish up in grass on a chatterbait lake is there's gonna be some places you may get into an area as big as a football field which has a little bit different grass density. It may come up a little higher, it may come up a little shorter. There may be more defined edges on it. Once you find that though, if you if you get two or three bites on an offshore grass area, you're in you're around a bunch of fish because fish always school up in grass lakes. You very seldom catch roamers. And that's the way that I fish grass lakes. I stay on those main flats all the time with that. And a lot of it with it is um like I said, when you're when you're talking about generating strikes on the chatterbait, and I'll sort of leave you guys with this. It's like any other thing in bass fishing. It's a it's a it's a it's a combination of a lot of different things because it, you're if you're in an area that's got a lot of fish in it, you're going to be able to go in there with the wrong color and the wrong retrieve, and you're still going to catch a few fish. But if you're going to maximize and get the most out of an area, you've got to hit on that right blade color, the the weight, the color of the skirt, the trailer color, the trailer profile any accent color on it, the, the, the pound test line, the retrieve, the cadence, all that type of stuff, you know, adds up to, you know, how much success you're going to enjoy with it. So the main thing is, like I said, when, you, when it's really important on chatterbait fishing, is when you start catching a few fish in there and you know the fish are biting it, you know that the mood and the personality of the fish are conducive to a chatterbait bite, that's when you need to experiment. Take that, once you know that they're on a chatterbait and you're catching them on it, take a few minutes to change blades, change skirt colors, change trailers, to tweak it, to fine tune it. Because you may be throwing a green pumpkin chatterbait with a stop and go retrieve and catching three fish an hour. And then you may go to a uh, some type of a shad pattern with a pumping retrieve and catch 15 fish an hour. So 
just take a little time to experiment because that's how you find out what they want from day to day. So anyway, guys, that's a uh, pretty good chatter or a pretty, you know, lengthy chatterbait seminar there. There's still a lot more to it, but that'll give you guys a pretty good foundation. I think if you don't know much about chatterbait fishing, it's going to, it's going to give you a good starting point. And even if you do fish a lot of it, hope you can, hope you learned a few things from this that might help you guys out. And again, much appreciated you guys subscribing to the channel and watching it. Um, and we'll, we'll be back next week with another one. See you.